Hello, everybody. Verbum Day Lectionary Podcast, proper 15. Who's excited? I'm excited. We're looking at two um, Old Testament readings today. Of course, the idea is you choose one. Uh, we chose here at St. Matthew's, Joshua. But let's look first at Proverbs 9. Why would we look at Proverbs 9? Well, the reason why is it's in connection with John chapter 6. So if you know anything about John chapter 6, you've been following along in the lectionary readings, which I hope you've been doing primarily at church. And if you've not, then you need to. Um, but also studying along at home, even before you get into church, can be a great idea. In case you've not thought about that, you're welcome. But um, in the Bread of Life narrative, What's the point? Where have we been? Where did we come from? Where are we going? I am the bread of life. Whoever eats of me, they'll never hunger. Whoever drinks of me will never thirst. What's he talking about? Some people say belief. I say they can't read if that's what they're saying. And you see this terminate at the end. Verses 51 to 59, 69. What's he say there? The food I give, the bread from heaven, my flesh, the drink, my blood. Whoever eats of my flesh, whoever drinks of my... What's he talking about? Obviously, he's talking about communion. Flesh and blood. Bread from heaven, who's in? It's him, right? So, we see at the end of this, you can see, if you can see my screen, if you can't, look at the end of Proverbs um, 9, well, at least our pericope, verses 5 and 6, right? He says... Come and eat of my food and drink of the wine I have mixed. And what is that? Well, in connection with John 6, we know what it is. But we're going to read more than that. It says here, 1 through 10. But that's really a strange pericopal cutting. So we're going to actually extend that when we look at it to at least verse 12. But before we get into that, there's so much to say. There's so, so much to say, so little time. But what can we say? We can say this. When we, when you look at the book of wisdom, sorry, I mean, the sorry, the book of Proverbs, you see wisdom as this personified character throughout the whole book. It's a woman in this book, and she is always um, posited as the opposite, the, the contrary antagonizing character on the opposing side of the woman known as folly. And so you have this doctrine of the two ways that you see in the Didache, that you see in Deuteronomy, that you see it's also in Exodus, you see it also in the letters of St. Paul, you see it in the intertestamental literature, in the patristic writings. There are two ways, one which leads to hell, one which leads to eternal salvation. Which way are you walking? And you can, you can characterize these in so many different ways. Are you walking the way of death or the way of life? The Lord says, I lay two paths before for you, one of death, one of life, which shall you choose? So on, right? You also see, you know, you have the way of, of darkness, you have the way of light. Which are you, are you walking in the light? Uh, St. Paul, he does this. He also says, though, going beyond uh, darkness and light, he says, do not be as those who live as those in the night, right? In, in the night, in the darkness, in the nighttime, you do all kinds of things, reveling, drunkenness, orgies, but live rather as those in the day, in broad daylight, doing acts of kindness, of goodness, of love, things that you would want people to see. Not as one who does things that are hidden and veiled because they're shameful, and you don't want anyone to know that you're doing. There's two ways, wisdom, folly, death, life, darkness, light, nighttime, day, you see? And so we have it We have it here. Now, we're talking very specifically about wisdom in this first paragraph here. Wisdom has built her house. So when we talk about folly, what does folly do? Does folly produce folly, like foolishness, stupidity? No, it, it, it doesn't build. It doesn't produce. It can only destroy and mess up, right? But wisdom is building a house. And on this house, there's seven columns. It's a strong house, right? This is what is being said. And she's prepared her meat, that is her food, mixed her wine. Now, talking uh, meat and wine and spreading a table, we're talking about a feast. But again, a feast in what regard? A feast in connection with the bread of life narrative in John 6. And you'll see throughout all the writings of the Holy Fathers, all the writings of the medievals, wisdom in the book of Proverbs is understood to be Jesus Christ, right? A type, a poetic kind of symbolism for him. And you'll understand this if you read maybe some more of the Greek literature where wisdom and reason, right, as you might say, logos in Greek, are very connected ideas, right? So also it is in the book of Proverbs, right? 
So if you wanted to say, of course, you can say this in a general sense, but then you're going to you're going to fail to read this Christologically, Christocentrically. You're not going to see Jesus on the page if you do that. But if you if you're interested in seeing Jesus, my Christian friends, right, then understand this connection. Let's talk about it this way. The Lord Christ is building his 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 house, his kingdom. Right. And it is a, a kingdom that is built up on strong columns and pillars. It will never be shaken. And this Christ, he's preparing a table for us. You could think a uh, Psalm 23 kind of thing, right? In the midst of our enemies, sure, you could do that. But what is this feast? It's a wine, fat things and flesh and mixed wine, right? And wisdom has sent out her servants and she calls from the heights over the cities, inviting everybody in. Right and and who specifically? Let whoever is naive, whoever whoever lacks with whoever stupid, come inside. Right? What's the idea here? Well, in the same way that Christ calls the lost, he goes the one who is light to the world. Where does he go to bring that light? To those who dwell in darkness. If the one who is light, where does he go to share life? What? To those who dwell in the darkness and the shadow of death. To those who live in anxiety, what does he go there to do to guide their feet into the way of peace? In the same way, you have here this personified wisdom. Who is this Jesus Christ, spoken of poetically, sure, right? Inviting in the whole world, the world that lacks what he has. And you bring that again back to the bread of life narrative. I am the bread you need. I am the super substantial bread. The epiousion, right? The bread you need. You're always looking for every other kind of thing as though these things can satisfy. Money, uh, video games, entertainment, sex, TV, drugs, more, bigger, better houses, faster cars, better job, prestige. Does any of it satisfy you? No. There is one thing, there's one thing which which does, and it's the one thing that outside of Christ you don't have, and it's Jesus himself. And yet, what does Jesus do? He looks at the world, which is starving, which is unsatisfied, which is locked in this, this destitute cycle of desire and despair, and he invites the whole world to come. And this is what, this is what we have at the altar, this invitation not, I'm not talking open communion, right? But this invitation that none would perish, but that all would come, all would repent, all would believe, all would receive the Lord Jesus Christ at that altar to come and eat of his food, which is what? His flesh. To come and drink of the wine that he's mixed. What is that? His blood, right? To forsake foolishness and have life. And where do you have life? You have it in Jesus Christ. To advance in the way of understanding, to grow to grow in knowledge. Whoever corrects the arrogant earns insults. Whoever reproves the wicked incurs, incurs opprobrium. Do not reprove the arrogant lest they hate you. Reprove the wise and they will love you. And what does this mean, right? We all know people who are like this, right? There's people who they're doing something wrong. They could probably benefit from advice. But there's a lot of people who hate advice. And this is not necessarily to, I heard a term once, throw meat to the base or whatever. And I don't really know what that term means, but I told it was to be used this way. And so I, let me just say, this is not so much to say, look at that stupid person over there who doesn't accept advice. Ha ha. Proverbs 9 verse 7 through 8 says that they're dumb. That's not the point. The point is to look into yourself. And realize, do you want to be wise? Do you want to walk the path of wisdom? Then love admonishment, love correction, love critique, love constructive criticism, right? But if you're the one who hears someone say, maybe you should do this this way, or maybe what you did was slightly unkind, or maybe you could adjust the way you speak about this person or the way that you did that thing in this way and then you say, screw you, who are you to say that? Well, then you're being stupid. You're being foolish, right? And it says here, instruct the wise, they'll become wiser. Teach the just, they'll advance in learning. But what happens if you're teaching the foolish? We teach the foolish, they'll become more foolish, right? This is the don't throw pearls to pigs thing. This is the 
to those whom they have, more will be given. To those who have not, what they even do have will be taken away. That's that thing, right? Now, he says here something that's crucial for us to understand. The beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. You want to walk in this in this way, you must have fear of the Lord and knowledge of the Holy One, which is true understanding. Now, this, I've written about this on the uh, Transcendent Truth Media blog. And because um, I think this is something that so many of us completely miss, completely don't understand, completely forget, because I see all the time secular scholars being heaped up or not heaped up. What's um put up onto a pedestal for Christians and say, oh, he's so wise. Oh, he's so smart. Oh, he has so much for us to learn. That's not true. Psalm 19, Psalm 119, they say that's not true. Proverbs 9 Verse John says that's not true, right? Those who understand, those who know the Lord, they have understanding, right? But if we, for example, I'm going to pull out a name here, which I pulled out in the in the blog article, people who take Jordan Peterson, for example. And of course, we're not talking math here. We're not talking like science lessons. We're talking life lessons. We're talking general wisdom. And people will buy his books, 10 rules, 10 more rules, 10 commandments, 20, 37, who cares, right? And they'll say, oh, I'm going to follow these things. This will help me achieve self-betterment, be a better person in the world. This is a man who has not committed himself to the Lord. This is a man who does not fear God as he should. This is a man who does not understand the Holy One. He does not have knowledge of Christ. He does not know the gospel of Jesus. And people will say, oh, but he teaches the scriptures. He teaches them wrongly. They'll say, oh, he's visiting churches and he's not a member of any of them. So is that the kind of person that we should be giving to our children as an example? Is that the kind of person we should be encouraging people to watch and to listen to people say, oh, he helped me get over my pornography addiction or he helped me clean up my room? That's very nice. You could have done that in the church, though, right? But what happens when we follow these people or teach others to follow those people? We see, I see this all the time. Well, if he's the paragon of virtue, if he's the one to be recommended, my pastors, my priests are not, our bishops are not, the Pope is not, the saints of the church are not, the theologians are not, the monks are not. Well, then what is the church? Something for us to think on. Something for us to think on, for sure. Now, we're going to look at the second Old Testament option. And it's a little bit broken in, in half here. We're going to start, so 1 through 2a, skip through 14 to 18. And this is radically different if you look at the Revised Common Lectionary. The pericopal cutting is totally different. Um, now... And mind you, I don't even think that the uh, Revised Common Lectionary has this for this Sunday. It does have it elsewhere, though. I don't remember where, but they cut it differently. Anyways, Joshua gathered together all of the tribes of Israel at Shechem, summoning the elders, the leaders, the judges, the officers of Israel. And when they stood in ranks before God, Joshua addressed all the people. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, in time past, your ancestors down to Terah, father of Abraham and Nahor, lived beyond the river and served other gods. And this, mind you, this is important because, well, you might not think so, but some people say um, Abraham's family was pagan, and then you'll have other people say, no, no, that's not true. It says it is right there. So keep that in your minds. Now we just have four verses from 14 through 18. Is that four? Yeah, that is. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him completely and sincerely. And this is, you know, I've said this before, and I'll say this again. It's a shame that when we have two optional readings for the Old Testament or for the New Testament, that we're expected to pick one because they often work so well together. Um, and sometimes I wish we could just extend the readings and just say, let's just have like five readings that Sunday. Let's just have six readings, right? I think that'd be neat. Um because this works perfectly together with Proverbs 9. Uh, this is where, well, let's just read it, and then I'll say what I have to say, right? Cast out the gods uh, your ancestors served beyond the river, right? That's uh, Cast out all of that pagan garbage and serve the Lord. Serve the Lord. 
And if it's displeasing to you to serve the Lord, choose today whom you will serve, the gods of your ancestors, right? Or God the Lord, right? As for me and my household, we will serve the Lord, right? So you have put here this kind of decision to decide not just um, what you're going to do, but who you're going to serve in the same way of this two paths kind of idea, right? You could ask yourself this, a simple question, especially to people who don't come to church every week. And this, I think they need to, <laughs> they need to hear this, right? Who choose this day whom you will serve the Lord or your sports coach choose this day whom you will serve parents, the Lord or your children's desires to play sports rather than come to church. Choose this day whom you will serve people who don't come to church because you're at some kind of fair, some kind of party. Who are, who is your God? Who do you worship? Do you worship God or yourself? Do you worship God or your friends? God or your family? God or your sports entertainment? You have to make a decision. It's not a both and situation. If I say to you, if I said to you, um, oh, here's another great example. Just throw that out, out of your head. Here's an amazing example. If we were to get married and I said, in this marriage, you will sleep only with me, right? And then you said, I will sleep with you sometimes, but every now and then I won't do that and I'll sleep with someone else, right? And you might not think that that's what's going on, but when the Lord says, you must come to church on Sunday, he says this, right? Do not forsake the gathering, right? You can also look at the types of the Old Testament and their worship. It's an obligation, it is. You, and I know a lot of Lutherans balk at this and they say, no, no, that's Reformed. That's Roman Catholic. You can't say that. Look, it's in the large catechism. My friends, it is, right? The small catechism might might have you thinking that we are not saying that church worship is an obligation. But if you go into the large catechism, it's quite obvious that it is. It's something you actually have to do. If you want to call yourself a Christian, you need to be at church. You cannot be prioritizing things over the divine service. You cannot be prioritizing things over the forgiveness of sins. You cannot be prioritizing things over the reception of the flesh and blood of your Lord, Jesus Christ, in the Holy Sacrament. You cannot be prioritizing other things over what God has commanded you to do. You can't, right? And this is the thing. It's not even as though there's something to gain or some kind of force pressuring them into what they're doing. It's simply that they want to do those things more than meet the Lord where he's promised to be. Part of this is because, of course, they're following that kind of um, hippieistic, um, almost pantheistic or panentheistic, Kyperian notion that God is just everywhere for me in the same way he is in church and the complete merging of of the sacred and the secular to the point that well why would i come to church i can find god on the green of the golf course i can find him in the fishing boat i can find him in the trees on my hiking trail that's not true right the trees on the hiking trail will never proclaim your forgiveness and they'll say oh i don't need i don't need that because i read the bible at home that's nice the bible will tell you to go to church this is how it is right a lot of people don't like this reality but it is reality right you need to choose actually definitely at a, some point in your life whether you actually want to be a committed christian or not and what what we're seeing in the west so often is christianity is failing christianity is falling apart because churches and congregations are made up of people who are half in and half out who are dipping their toes in the waters of baptismal christianity but they're not going all the way under and so you don't have a church that has decided to serve the Lord. But you have a church that has decided to sometimes serve the Lord. Unless something better comes along. Unless there's something that they'd rather be doing. Unless they have family over. Unless they have a sports game. Unless they are getting paid overtime to work that. Do you see what I'm saying? This can't be the case. There's two ways. It's not... It's not as though it's a gradation scale. It's black and white. You're either walking away from the Lord or you're walking toward the Lord. 
You're either walking with the Lord or you're walking apart from the Lord. You're either at divine service or you're not at divine service. You're either receiving the absolution or you're dead in your sins. That's how it is. You're either full of the flesh and blood of Christ or you chose not to partake of it. But the people answer, far be it from us to forsake the Lord to serve other gods. Yet this is what they did. Yet this is what we do too. For it was the Lord our God who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. He performed those great signs before our eyes and protected us along our entire journey and among all the peoples who through whom we passed at our approach the Lord drove out all the peoples, including the Amorites who dwelt in the land. Therefore, we will serve the Lord, for he is our God. That is to say, all these things the Lord has done for us, that's why we're going to worship and serve God. We see this also in our small catechism at the end of the Ten Commandments, and also at the end of the Creed, for all these things, especially first article of the Creed, for all these things, it is our duty to serve, to worship the Lord God to give him thanks for all that he does. Now, we're brought to Psalm 34, verses 12 through 23. So we see here, <clears throat> oh, I think I lost my, there we go, there we go. That's what we want. That's what we want, friends. So what do we have here? Psalm 34, who is the man who delights in life? Sorry, it should be from 12. No, actually, it's just because of the NABRE. No worries. I, I understand this. Who is the man who delights in life, who loves to see the good days? Keep your tongue from evil, your lips from speaking lies. Turn from evil and do good. So what's he talking about? The two ways, right? Do you want to delight in life, things that are good? Do you want to see the good days? Well, here's another thing. And this is basically the message of the psalm. I hear people say all the time, I wish I had more good things in my life. I wish I could see the good days again, whether they're talking health-wise, whether they're talking financially, whether they're talking relationally, is single people trying to manifest girlfriends through wishing, uh, people trying to manifest better health through wishing they had it or complaining that they don't have it. We see this all the time. What's the message? Do you want life? Do you want goodness? Then do those things. Walk that path. Again, this is the great wisdom of the doctrine of the two ways. Um, think physically for a second. Think of your physical health. Do you want to be healthy? You say, everyone says, yes, I do. Don't eat pizza. Don't eat McDonald's. Exercise. Make sure you're eating properly, getting your vitamins and minerals. People say, oh, but moderation, moderation. How has moderation, <laughs> how has moderation blessed you recently? Or what you call moderation, right? Probably not that well, right? People say, oh, I really wish I had more money. Stop spending it on things you don't need. Well, if you want more money, start acting in accordance with that. If you want better health, start acting in accordance with that. If you want better relationships, start loving people, start forgiving people, start prioritizing people over your own selfish needs and desires, right? This is what he's saying. Do you want to delight in life? Do you want to see the good days? Then keep your tongue from evil. Keep your lips from speaking lies, right? Turn from evil and instead do good. This, like leave Leave the path of death Walk on the path of life, right? Leave the path of darkness. Walk instead on the path of, of, of life and light. The eyes of the Lord are directed towards the righteous and his ears toward their cry. The Lord's face is against the evildoers to wipe out their memory from the earth. The righteous cry out, the Lord hears. And he rescues them from their afflictions. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those whose spirits are crushed. Many are the troubles of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him from them all. He watches over his bones and not one of them shall be broken. Evil will slay the wicked. Those who hate the righteous are condemned. The Lord is the redeemer of the souls of his servants and none are condemned who take refuge in him. 
Do you want to be saved? Follow the Lord. Do you want goodness? Walk in goodness. Do you, you know, it's simple, right? And we have this, this theme also in the Lord's Prayer, though many, for some reason, fail to see it. And what is this I'm talking about? Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us, right? This is the doctrine of the two ways. Some people have paganized this, and they call it something like the law of attraction. It's not actually the law of attraction. It's this. Hurt people hurt people. If you destroy things, things will be broken around you. Broken things do not create fixed and whole and perfect things. Only fixed, whole, perfect things do that, right? Broken things break more things. Destruction leads to more destruction. But goodness, blessing, forgiveness, love gives forth to that which it is. That's all, that's all we're talking about. So let's look then at this at this gospel reading before we go to Ephesians, and I hope and pray to the Lord I don't forget uh, to look at our Ephesians reading before we close. But I want to get here before we get too far. And this is, of course, back into the bread of life narrative, connecting with um, that end piece from Proverbs chapter 9 from the first paragraph there, verse 5 and 6, I think it was. I am the living bread. That came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give is the flesh, is my flesh for the life of the world. Now, I said earlier, a lot of people, and this goes back to Luther. We can blame him for this. Um, because of in the Marburg colloquy, when he was when he was arguing with Ulrich Zwingli, and Ulrich Zwingli was saying, This is not about communion. And if it was, it says, no, sorry, oh Ulrich Zwingli, I believe, was saying it is about communion. And because Jesus says, you know, the flesh is not what matters, but the spirit, that therefore um, his spiritual understanding of Christ's presence in the sacrament is true. Luther's was not. Luther, therefore, wanting to win the argument, said, which well, not actually about communion at all. This is just about faith and belief. So uh, let's, I, let's think about that. Does that sound correct? Might sound correct to some people, but then this entire text is an obstacle to your theology. This is why, right? What are we talking about? We're talking about the bread that has come down from heaven. He says, who is this bread? I am this bread. There, can you say it's not about eating, it's about the spirit, and it's about belief? Sure, you could do that, except for the part where he says you must eat of this bread. He says, I am the living bread that has come down from heaven. Has he physically come down from heaven? Yes, technically, right? Because who is the one who has assumed the humanity Who like, in Jesus, right? Jesus is the Logos. The Logos took humanity onto himself, right? This is the same idea. Whoever eats of this bread, and what's the bread? Jesus, who came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this Jesus will live forever. The bread that I will give, is it uh, faith? Is it self? No, it's his flesh. For the life of the world. The Jews then, they correctly understand this. Who is this man that will give us his flesh to eat? Jesus says to them, Amen, Amen. I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man. So they, if, if it were true that this is not about eating and drinking his flesh, he would have said, no, you misunderstood me. Does he? No, he doesn't. He doubles down. They, so he says, I'm the living bread. You must eat of my flesh. To live, to have life in you. They say, that's disgusting. How can you give us your flesh to eat? That's obviously forbidden by all of the laws in the scriptures. Jesus then doesn't say, no, hold on. You've misunderstood, although he could easily do that. Rather, he says, no, no, no. Amen, amen, I say to you, unless you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you do not have life within you. And this is extremely important, especially for when we talk about communion policies, and I don't mean to cause any fights here, but we could maybe talk about retention rates. We could. Why are all the kids leaving the church? Why do kids not take confirmation and first communion seriously when they're already at the age of 15, 16, God forbid 17? Well, probably because you have 
accidentally taught them that communion is not necessary, that it's not really part of their salvation. And in lacking communion, they thus have no life in them, right? And people say, no, you can't say that. You can't say that. Only baptism is necessary. Only the preached word is necessary, not according to Jesus. Unless you eat of my flesh, unless you drink of my blood, you have no life in you. But if you eat of my flesh, if you drink of my blood, you have life in you. I abide in you and you abide in me. Sacrament of communion is necessary. I know a lot of people say communion is not necessary for salvation. They love to say this during um, COVID, but they love to say this even outside of COVID. And this is why you have so many Lutheran congregations violating the Book of Concord, where it says in AP 24, paragraph one, we as low Lutheran churches celebrate the sacrament of communion, the mass, every Sunday and midweek feast days. We do, right? But they say, no, 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 you don't do that. It's not necessary for salvation. Only the word and baptism are necessary for salvation. Again, are we Lutherans? Are we not going to check that by the word? I think we should check that by the word. Let's check that by the word. Unless you eat of my flesh, unless you drink of my blood, you have no life in you, right? Who? So here's the other thing. Who is the one who knows what's necessary for your salvation? Jesus Christ or you? It's probably him. Now, if we say it's him, how are we going to find out what he thinks is necessary for us and for our salvation? Probably the things, first of all, that he said are necessary for salvation, which he says right here, part of that is eating his flesh, part of that is drinking his blood. But then beyond that, the things he instituted. Who are we to say the things that Jesus Christ instituted are not necessary? right? That the things that Jesus Christ instituted are up for discussion, that it's up for discussion whether we truly need them, whether they're truly necessary, what they truly are, what they truly do, what they're truly for. No, don't do that. Rather, bow to his word, believe in his word, trust in his word, humbly receive his word. And so he says, he says this again and again and again, Unless you eat of the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life within you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I'll raise him on the last day. For my flesh is true food, my blood is true drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him, just as the living Father sent me, and I have life because of the Father. So also the one who feeds on me will have life because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, unlike your ancestors who ate and still died. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. What's the bread? His flesh, right? These things he said while he was teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum, that went bad down there in the synagogue. They hated this, right? But so many people today hate this too. Even in all of those Protestant churches, as they call themselves, right? Not including us, which we have nothing in common with them, right? But all the Baptists, the Presbyterians, if I got up there and I said this in just slightly different words, same words, really, but just rearranged it a bit. I didn't say it was from the Bible or something. And I just said, got up there, in order to be saved, you must eat the flesh of Jesus Christ and drink his blood. How would that go? Well, they say, you're Catholic. Yes, I am. That's true, right? Evangelical Catholic Lutheran. But will they accept that? No, they won't, right? But that's the word of Jesus Christ. And so the result of this, what happens? Many of his disciples who were listening, not strangers, his disciples said, this saying is hard, who can accept it? And since Jesus knew, knew that, he says, does this shock you, right? What if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? Again, we said, um, um, has Jesus not come down from heaven? He says right here, he has. To where he was before, ascending back to there. Is it the Spirit that gives life? Yes, it is. While the flesh is of no avail. What's he saying? This is the whole Zwingli thing, right? This is the whole Zwingli thing. The words I've spoken to you are spirit and life, and this is where the trouble comes in for so many people. They say, well, Jesus himself said, right after he says the flesh and the blood stuff, he says, the flesh is of no avail, but the words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life, right? And so they do this kind of thing, which they like to call interpreting scripture by scripture, but what have they actually done? They've taken this latter scripture and they've allowed it. This is like one verse, right? This is one verse, verse 63. They've allowed this to completely dismember and almost delete by and large, not just this paragraph, but the entirety of John 6, the whole point of it, right? Interpreting scripture by scripture. So the question is like, what does this 
actually, what does this actually mean? See, the problem is, if you were to say that when he says the flesh profits nothing, that he's referring to you know, even, even like not just communion and the flesh that is there in the sacrament, but also his flesh itself, then the incarnation makes no sense. If you're saying that his flesh in the incarnation, his flesh in the sacrament is of no avail, then the entirety, not just of John 6, 52 through 59, is made mute and of no avail, but the entirety of the bread of life narrative is made complete nonsense, right? Unless you are to do this reformed kind of absurdist thing where you say flesh means not flesh. Spirit means, or, or um, flesh means spirit. But that's not what he's doing. That's not what he's doing. Because he says the spirit is what gives life. The flesh is of no avail. The words I've spoken are spirit and life, right? And so you have this kind of problem. What is he talking about? Well, let's turn. I've got some patristic commentaries for you to look at. We'll look first at Chrysostom and Augustine. I have also here Cyril and Hengstenberg, a Lutheran commentator. We'll see if we get that far. But Chrysostom says, this is from his homilies, he tries to remove their difficulties in another way as follows. It is the spirit which quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. That is to say, you ought to understand my words in a spiritual sense. He who understands them carnally is profited nothing. To interpret carnally is to take a proposition in its bare literal meaning and allow no other. But we should not judge of mysteries, that is sacraments, the Greek word for sacraments, in this way, but examine them with the inward eye understanding them spiritually. And the Reforms say, yes, 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 that's what we're doing. But that's not what Christostom is saying. He says, it was carnal to doubt how our Lord would give his flesh to eat. It's not carnal to say we must eat his flesh. He says, what then? Is it not real flesh? That's what the Reformed are saying. He goes on, yea, verily, it is real flesh. In saying then that the flesh profited nothing, he does not speak of his own flesh, but of that carnal hearer of his word. That's probably still unclear, so let's read another. Augustine, this is from his tracts. Or thus, the, the flesh profited nothing. They had understood by his flesh, as it were, of a carcass that was to be cut up and sold in the shambles, not of a body animated by the Spirit that is alive together, right? So in the Hebrew understanding with which Jesus and his hearers are working with, the human person is not a soul, that inhabits a flesh carcass, like a, a vehicle or something, but the person is flesh and spirit together. That is a nephesh, a living soul. And so he says, we're talking of a body animated, joining the spirit to the flesh, and then it profits much. For if the flesh profited not, the word would not have become flesh and dwelt among us. The spirit had done much for our salvation by means of his flesh, for the flesh does not cleanse of itself, but the word who assumed it, which word, being the principle of life in all things, having taken up both soul and body, cleanses the souls and bodies of those who believe. So again, let's come back to this text, right? What's he saying when he says the flesh uh, profits nothing, but the spirit is that which gives life. You go back to the beginning of the bread of life narrative, and they're saying we want the flesh for our stomachs. And he says, no, don't seek after the flesh Flesh, or sorry, the food of this world. Don't seek after the bread of this world. Don't seek after the bread which will only benefit your bodies, but the one which will benefit your whole being, your body in the resurrection, your soul in forgiveness and cleansing. And so when 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 the reformed will say this means this means that if there is flesh in the sacrament, it's useless, right? And this often does even go down to the incarnation, and they say you cannot worship the humanity of Christ. Sorry, they're inseparably they're inseparably inseparably connected, inseparably connected, right in the person of Jesus Christ, where you have the union of divine and human in one person, the hypostatic union in the person of Jesus. And he says here, though, the words I've spoken to you, they are spirit and life. But there are some who do not believe these words. Which words? Right? This. So you have to understand, right? The words he's speaking, which are spirit and life, 
what are they directing you to? And this is something that, again, the reform and so many Lutherans too, they misunderstand. Like when we talk about, um, there's a pretty common debate in our Lutheran churches, which is like, what's more important, the preaching or reading of the word or the sacraments, right? Is it this idea that the preach word has preeminence over the sacraments as some would like, or is it that the sacraments have preeminence over the preached word? Well, we can solve this simply. Look at the scriptures in the relation to the word itself. When I say word of God, what am I talking about? A lot of people will say you're talking about the scriptures. Yes, but, yes, but that word is the written record of something that happened in manifest history. And that thing that happened in manifest history is what? The person of Jesus. The word, again, made flesh. Made flesh, why? Because does flesh profit nothing? Then made flesh, why? Right? And so it also is with the sacrament. I can preach to you all day about what Jesus did on the cross. Right? I can. I can do that. But if you never come to the altar, if you never receive the sacrament, and what's the sacrament? The body given on that cross. The blood shed on that cross. I can preach to you about the cross. But in the sacrament, what am I doing? I'm handing you the cross. In the sacrament, what am I doing? I'm putting you there upon that cross. I can preach to you about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, but when I baptize you, I am uniting you to and plunging you in to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. That's the way the scriptures speak. That's the, the whole fullness of this, the whole purpose of this, is not to stop with the preached word, with the written word, with the read word, but the reality of these things which breaks through into our present sacramentally, connectively. And so again, what does this mean? It's the spirit that gives life, the flesh is of no avail. Of course the flesh is no of no avail because without the spirit, it's dead, right? Humanity itself without the logos redeeming us is condemned. But the logos, what does he do? He takes flesh and he takes it upon himself and into himself. And then humanity is redeemed. That's the atoning work of the incarnation. That's the salvific work of the incarnation. And so he says, the words I speak to you are spirit and life. Why? Because they direct you to the flesh, which is spiritual. And this is why when St. Paul talks about the resurrection, he says, you'll not, you'll not have fleshly carnal bodies, but spiritual bodies. That doesn't mean they're not flesh. They are, but they're spiritually flesh, right? They're united with the spirit. But there are some of you who do not believe, he says. Jesus knew from the beginning the ones who would not believe and the ones who would betray him. And he said, for this reason, I've told you that no one can come to me unless granted by my Father. As a result of this, many of his disciples returned to their former ways of life, no longer accompanied him. And Jesus said to the twelve, do you want to also leave me? And Simon Peter answered him, Master, to whom shall we go? This is the gospel acclamation. You have the words of eternal life. We've come to believe and are convinced that you are the Holy One of God. And Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, twelve? Yet is not one of you a devil. So what's happening here? Um, again, Jesus has preached his sermon about, well, what is the sacrament of communion? The body and blood of Christ given and shed for you to be eaten for the forgiveness of your sins and the salvation of your souls. A lot of people don't like that. A lot of people don't like that. But what does he say of it? It's necessary. A lot of people don't like that. They heard it. They said, no, you can't mean that. He said, actually, I do mean that. He said it like five different times, five different ways. So they leave. Does he stop them? Does he say, no, you've misunderstood? No, he doesn't. He doubles down and he triples down, right? And that's it. So, um, when we come then to Ephesians 5, we have again this thing about the two ways. Duty to live in the light. Let no one deceive you with arguments, empty arguments. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the disobedient, so don't be associated with them. This is a hard thing for people to hear, but this is also the Psalm 1 kind of thing. Blessed is the man who doesn't walk in the way of sinners, doesn't sit in the seat of scoffers, doesn't stand in that, that way, right? But he delights in the way of the Lord. You see this also in other Psalms, right? You see this also in 1 Corinthians 5. Don't judge those outside of the church, but judge those inside. Don't even eat with one of these people who falsely claims to be a brother, yet lives in things like sexual immorality. Again, hard thing for people to accept. Don't be associated with them. It's not just don't go to the altar with them. People totally forget this. Don't be associated with them. For you were once 
in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of the light, for light produces every kind of goodness and righteousness and truth. Try to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in fruitless works of darkness, but expose them. For it is shameful to even mention these things done by them in secret, but everything exposed by the light becomes visible, for everything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. Watch carefully then how you live, not as foolish persons, but as wise, making the most of the opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not continue in ignorance, but try to understand what is the will of the Lord. This, again, is picking up on that Proverbs 9 thing. This is perfect uh, for either Proverbs 9 or for our Joshua reading, right? Both texts are going to be picked up on beautifully here. Um, again, um, true wisdom. Where does it begin? Fear of the Lord. Knowledge of God is the beginning of understanding. Don't walk in ignorance, walk in understanding. Don't walk in darkness, walk in light. Don't walk in death, walk toward the life that is Christ. And do not get drunk on wine in which lies debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. So talking about, again, two things to be filled with, uh, drugs and alcohol or the Holy Spirit. Pick one, right? Um, two kinds of ways to be, asleep or awake. Two kinds of ways to be, dark or light. Two, li two kind of ways, dead or alive, right? He's calling you to walk, again, two ways, walk in the correct one, walk in the one which God has given you to walk in, right? And this goes back all the way to the preceding chapters of Ephesians that we've been walking through week by week by week, right? Of such were some of you, but now you have. This is that same idea, right? Of such were some of you, you were dead in your trespasses and sins, but the Lord made you alive. Now, therefore, walk as one who's being alive, actually live. The Lord has resurrected you, but now you must live that resurrected life out in the world, right? Now, I love how this ends. It says, um, it says it ends with verse 21, be subordinate to one another um, in the reverence, out of reverence for Christ. Um, beautiful. I, you know, I kind of question why they would include that verse, but there it is. Anyways, nevertheless, what's, what's the whole idea here? Of course, you have addressing one and on one another in Psalms, hymns and spiritual songs, and that's beautiful. Um, but the bulk of it is that first large portion, all about the two ways, all about the two ways. So what are we saying, right? I mean, we've covered everything here, but what are we saying in all of it? If you take all of these readings from the lectionary, of course, you have this huge emphasis on the sacrament of communion, huge emphasis on the body and blood of Christ, eating and drinking the Lord Christ. But the vast majority, and that's what I'm preaching on. That's what most, probably most Lutheran pastors are going to be preaching on. But the emphasis of the lectionary for this coming Lord's Day, unmistakable, the doctrine of the two ways, death, life, darkness, light, evil, good. That's it, right? Calling our people to live correctly. That's what it's about, at least for this Sunday. Anyways, I pray you guys have a blessed Lord's Day, a blessed week, and um, I'll see you next time. God be with you and God be praised. Bye-bye.